everyone if you're in the West African time zone and hello, let me just say hello everyone. Welcome to the business of communication session being hosted at Comms Avenue. My name is Adi Doreen Jayasini and I'm going to be moderating this session and which I hope is very insightful for you. And I'm going to go into just introducing our really amazing speakers today. We're gonna have, we have Liz Grossman Kitui, she's the co-founder of the Premier Africa Focus social impact firm, Baoba Consulting. We also have Samuel Bekele, who is the founder of founder and CEO of Spotlight Communications and Marketing, one of Ethiopia's leading public relations agency. We have Tutu Adetumbi, who is the founder of Tutu Adetumbi Consultancy, full service digital marketing agency. And Eluin Barry, who is the CEO of African Media Agency, and she's done outstanding work across the continent. So we're going to be learning from our speakers today what exactly is the business of communications? How do you position yourself? How do you pitch yourself? How do you price? What are the structures and the models that has worked on them? And our goal is that you'll be able to learn lessons from their journeys and their successes. So they're going to be sharing a lot of personal examples. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat so that we will go through them during the course of the conversation. So welcome again, dear speakers. Thank you for joining us. I'm just going to go to the first question that I have. So we're going to start with starting out. And Elwin, I'm going to start with you. So before you started your agency, you've been 15 years in the industry professionally, started out your agency. What were some of the things that you put in place to ensure that your business actually succeeds? Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Hi, Adedine. Thank you for, for that question. I'm very excited to, um, to talk about this because as we were just saying while preparing, we sort of you know, want to get into the action modes. It's not just about the African narrative, but it's how do you actually get stuff done? So I'm, I'm very pleased with the, the topic of today. Um, I never, you know, I'm not your typical entrepreneur. I never sat down and decided I will start a PR agency or I will start a company that will be called African Media Agency. I sort of stumbled upon opportunities. One thing that I knew is that this industry was mine. Um, it does fit my value. It fits who I am as a person. It's an industry that requires everything from your soul. And I knew that the only way I could be happy in my professional life is to pick an industry that would align with my values. So once that was defined, then I sort of sat down and really committed myself to working really, really hard. Um, but I also took some calculated risks. Um, so my first venture, um, I made it, you know, I was like, okay, fine. I have that opportunity to start building that first wire for Africa. I've been told that for me to start doing this, we have only six months of, my, of cash flow for my salary. So I did sign a partnership with the company that I was working with to make sure that at least half of it was covered. You know, it was, it was that little margin, that little calculated risk, because I knew that if I had on top, I knew that if I wanted to be brave, I also had to have some form of security. Uh, which might actually go against what I'm going to say next, because I think that we need to be bold, you know, we need to take actions, we need to be empathetic. But at the time, it just felt right. Um, and I think, you know, it's funny, yesterday I was actually listening to a podcast, um, a Brené Brown podcast, and she was saying, if it's scary, it's not dangerous. So, you know, I think there's also that part of me that was saying, okay, fine, it might be very scary, but what can happen? You know, I'm going to start that. If it fails, I'll start something else. But that's, that was one thing that I put in place. And then I committed to be, you know, I never wanted to be a boss, um, but I wanted to work on my leadership style. So I was like, okay, what do I want to be? You know, I want to be action driven. I want to be empathetic and I want to be bold. Um, and I work on that still every day, especially on the bold front, because it's not easy. And then I also realized that it was okay to start small. And I think we get served that kind of story, that entrepreneurship story, 
um, that makes you feel that if you don't start a business that's IPO material within five to 10 years, it's not a business. So then your imposter syndrome comes in and kicks in really hard and you just have to push it away. It's okay to start small. It's, and you know, you're building something. So you start with a foundation. You're not going to start with the roof, start small, start alone and then start building. And I was okay doing it this way. I was fine saying, you know, I'm going to start by myself, entirely alone, and then I'll build it. Um, and I then, you know, when things sort of started picking up, um, I always ensured that, um, so first of all, obviously getting ready to, to, to get the hours and like working the long hours, but always keeping an eye um, on my, on our revenue and keeping an eye on, on, uh, on how much money that we make. And this is a great advice that I got from Nikki James, um, who told me never always make sure that you keep an eye at your finances. And if you don't know how to do this, learn how to do it, you know, educate yourself because ultimately a business is about leadership and figures. If you don't get that right, you're going to fail. Um, so I think these are the, the things that I put in place, you know, being bold, starting small, being courageous um, and looking at a business structure where I knew that if I, I hire only, if I can make sure that I've got a full year of salary for that particular person at the moment I hire, or I make sure a retainer will cover my salaries um, or the salaries of my team and growing slowly, steadily, but surely. So what I'm hearing is, you know, definitely pacing yourself. And what you said about the figures part, I think that it comes as an afterthought to a lot of people coming into the business of comms, but it's so critical to be able to look at your figures and say, is this going to sustain? Is this sustainable? Do I have the right model? So thank you for that. Liz, I'm going to come to you with the same question, starting out, what, what structures did you put in place? And for you, especially because you, you, you work from outside, uh, from America, but you have footprints across the continent, how did you decide to put in the structures and, and places to build that business? Sure. I think, well, first of all, Eloine, I just feel like you and I, same same wavelength on so many things. Um, I didn't set out to start a comms agency. That wasn't my goal, um, but that's what happened. And so I'm grateful for that. For me, um, just a bit of like personal background. I, my first trip to Africa was as a student in 2007, I went to Cameroon and I, as an American had all kinds of, you know, images and, you know, everybody tells you what Africa is and it's, I, I found it was wrong. <laughs> what I had thought was was very wrong. So um, after that experience, I went back to Cameroon, did some more research, um, all in the comms and internet space. And then when I was graduating from my undergraduate, all I wanted to do was work in Africa. Um, I applied to hundreds of jobs um, and ultimately got a teaching position in Dakar, Senegal. And that really just led me um, you know, to many different opportunities. But one of the main things that was was happening in all of the different jobs and 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 work that I was doing was that there is a very there's an imbalance in relationships, the way that Americans and global partners are coming into Africa and like trying to teach or save or do all of these things that was not really aligning with my own personal mission, my own, my own values. So Eloine mentioned values. I think for me, having the values in place is so important because at the end of the day, you're trying to build something that can make a difference in what you care about. So that for me was the driving force with uh, deciding to start Baobab. And for me, one of the first things that I had in place that ensured my business actually succeeds is having a co-founder. Um, so I was lucky to co-found Baobab um, with Taib Fall. He is Senegalese. We met in Senegal. We co-founded the company while I was living in Dakar and he was in San Luis. Um, so it was remote since its since, since its founding. And then when I, uh, in 2016, decided I needed to understand my own country uh, and my own uh, space in order to be more impactful for the continent, I moved to New York to kind of set up shop here. And I think when 
you know, things to put into place. Well, first expectations, like I think we go into, I'm going to have my own business so I can make my own rules and I get to make my own hours and I get to do what I want. Your clients that you ultimately find are the ones who, who dictate your hours. Um, so I think expectations, I think understanding that you need to build your reputation, you need to build trust. Um, you can come with your networks to your own practice and that's great, but usually you're coming in from a hat of, you know, I was working uh, as a communications officer at an NGO. So I had that was my hat. Liz and Liz as Baobab Consulting, nobody knew that. So it takes time and patience. So I think coming into, you know, coming into your business with those understandings, deciding how you want to work. Do you want to go alone? Like, are you a solo co-founder that you want to, you want to build it by yourself? Do you need a team right from the beginning? I needed a team. So I got a team. Um, yeah. And I think that's kind of where I can, where I can pause for now in terms of what I set up um, and we can dive into more examples as yeah. we go. We're definitely going to dive into the, the team's part, but I'm going to move to Samuel now. So let's talk about structure, business. Model. How important is it to have the right business model for a successful communications business? And for you, do you have a business model that you go with and how did you create your business model? Um, thank you so much, Ade. Um, I think when Eloin and Liz were speaking earlier, I was saying every entrepreneur have literally similar stories to tell. And I was just smiling every time, you know, Eloin was saying, it's just, I am talking, literally that's exactly my story. And when Liz is talking about some of the things as she started her own business um, in, 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 in the agency uh, sector, it's literally my own testimony. And I was just smiling and I'm really happy to hear that. And I'm pretty sure everybody in the world shares the same experience. So to answer your question, I think the way you position your company from the get-go is gonna determine how your company is gonna be uh, viewed, right? Like from the very beginning, when I started Spotlight Communications and Marketing, I didn't start a small agency. I started an agency with 45 employees in mind. Four years later, we have 45 employees, what, 40, 43. Um, it's very important to start with the end in mind. Um, I had the opportunity and the privilege of working at one of the largest PR and communications agency in Ethiopia. So I was their chief strategist. So that gave me an opportunity to understand exactly how pricing, pitching, and different strategies work. So that, that laid a huge foundation for me. But before then, just like Liz, not at a, at a nonprofit, but at a multinational drinks business. I was working in corporate relations, reputation, and crisis management. So in order to answer your question, how you position your company, your organization, your agency from the very beginning is a very important factor to sustain that credibility, that reputation. So start with the end in mind. Just because you're founding a company on your own, it doesn't mean a small, it's a small agency. So that's one of the critical business models. If we're talking about revenue models, Flexibility is very important, right? A lot of us are really addicted to retainer. We don't have a lot of money when we start our business. And when we talk about the consultancy and PR business, it's all about retainers, but it's very important to create a revenue model that's extremely diverse instead of fixating on what the industry is used to or what the country is used to. When it comes to business model, a lot of people focus on revenue, but I think it's very important to focus on internal operations. I'm going to tell you one testimony. The first person I hired was a finance manager, a 35-year experienced finance manager, an older lady uh, that had a lot of experience in finance. Her son is my one of my head of strategies here now. Um, the reason why I did that was I knew Putting my finances in order is going to let me onboard uh, multinational organizations, right? When Coca-Cola first came to us, the first thing they wanted was a two-year audit, right? Financial report. So a lot of businesses, especially in Ethiopia, they, they take the financial management aspect of their business, especially that business model for granted. So by the time huge opportunities present themselves, they won't be able to. So let's, let's think ahead of ourselves in terms of business model, revenue model. That's what I like to say on that. I really like that. And so you were prepared when the opportunities with the big guys came in. Amazing. So let's go into structure and teams. And I'm going to move to Tutu now. And so I know personally you moved from freelancing 
now you have your own consultancy. How are you able to build the right structure for your business that helps you to do what you do now? Thank you, Adedoni. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. And Samuel, I completely agree with what you said about thinking with the end in mind. And I think for me, that's even a mindset I brought into um, moving on from a freelancer to having my own consultancy. How I did that was I kind of, I had worked in the social media digital marketing business for about three, four years, but then I realized that I didn't want to do every single thing myself. It became kind of a hectic job to kind of be the only, you know, I think in this business, even in communications, you are the job. So if you're sleeping and your client needs something, you have to do that. So I kind of imagined a kind of like an agency or a digital marketing agency where everything, every person had a role to play in the client's page or account or brand. And then I branded it in my head. I branded exactly what I wanted it to look like. I then started hiring bit by bit. So when I would scale up, I would then add on to my team. And that was how I started doing it bit by bit until I was able to kind of reach, you know, now we're a staff of seven. And it was, it had to be by scaling up bit by bit, having C, which is something that I always find you don't see all the time here. And then, yeah, just. Thank you, Tutu. What I'm hearing so far is, you know, pace yourself. Definitely have your eyes on the money. And I like what you said about you can't really do everything by yourself, which um, speakers have touched on, Edwin and, and Liz, of collaborating. Do you need people? So I'm going to come back to Liz because, I've, I mean, when I first met you, I was really fascinated about how you have this remote structure with different teams across the world, across continents and countries. And same thing with Edwin as well. So what are some of the helpful teams tips that you can share in terms of building the right team? So I'll start off with Liz and then Elwin, you can also add on. Sure. So maybe I can start with a little story time um, and I can tell kind of how our company was founded and then how the team was grown. So um, like I said, I co-founded the company in Senegal um, with my co-founder, Taib. I moved to New York. We continued to work. We had a few small clients in Senegal. I came to New York, took on a few clients here. Um, and then after about a year, um, we realized, okay, you know, we're growing this idea. We think we're growing this really cool company but it's just the two of us now. So we need some more people to come on. And so at that point, we didn't have any money. You know, we didn't take any investment. We didn't take any money. We were just, you know, bootstrapping and using our WhatsApps and our and our computers. And so we put together, we said, well, is anybody going to want to just join us on this, you know, idea? Uh, we don't have anything to pay them. Let's just put out a job description and see. So in that job description, we put out two. One was a communications officer and one was a business development officer. And in the job description, we said, this role is pro bono. You will not be getting paid, but you're going to get to work with some amazing people. You're going to get, uh, you know, mentorship and all of the things that we can offer you, we will offer. Um, and we were like, nobody's going to say yes to this. We were shocked. We had so many resumes. And I think it was because we were very clear about the values. What we wanted to promote was equitable collaboration, mutual understanding, and partnerships, true partnerships between the US and Africa. And so because of that, so many people felt that they were willing to contribute to the growth of our company. And that is how we have scaled and grown to this day. Um, so now we have a remote team of about 25 people. They contribute different elements um, aligned with their own interests, um, aligned with their own goals. So every person at Baobab comes in, not just to earn some cash, but to you know earn experience and to really, really, um, you know, have access to things that they may not have had access to. Um, so that is really how we've scaled it. In terms of the remote structures, I think um, we rely heavily on WhatsApp. We rely heavily on Google. We've built the entire company using Google Drive and Google Suite. 
Um, we now, as we get bigger and we scale, which uh, is really exciting, we're putting together a big Trello board where everybody's activities is there. Um, we have, I just got off of a CEO office hours call that I do. So anybody who's on the team can come ask me questions. I tell them what's going on at the company, um, have those touch points. And um, yeah, I think when it comes to building the right team, it's really about first understanding everybody's values. What are they looking to get out of their own careers? What are they looking um, to learn? What kinds of projects do they want to be put on? Um, and then um, giving them those opportunities to do so and then hiring them on the paid client projects that do come in. So for us, it's been, yeah, uh, it's been, uh, it's been that that's how we've uh, really built it. Amazing. And I, and I did a project with the Baobab team and I, I totally enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. What about you, Lewin? Can you share some tips that have worked for you? Sure. Um, I think so very similar setup to Liz where I'm based in New York. I've got team in Abidjan, in Kampala, in Johannesburg, in Senegal, in Senegal, across Francophonic Africa. Looking at it from a pre-COVID perspective, people were like, how do you get any work done? But we, we do. We've been doing that for eight years. So, so we know we know how to do it. It's like, you know, it was funny when COVID hit and it was like, oh, the working from home culture. I was like, I've got this, I think I'm okay. <laughs> you know, it's not really going, going to change my life. But I think the key thing, because it's not for everybody, um, it can be very hard for some people to work from home. And I've decided to hire you know, young people that didn't necessarily have a lot of office interaction. So for me, it was important to set them up. So I do have offices. Um, I think the key thing also before moving on to how we structure our days and what we do during the week to sort of, you know, keep that glue and like bond together without necessarily seeing each other. Um, hiring well is very important. You need to invest in the people you hire, you, you hire. You need to look at the right profiles. You need to look at the, um, what they want to achieve, what they can bring to the table, their, their behaviors. You can read someone fairly quickly by asking the right questions. Um, and I think this is something that we've been doing really well. It's like making sure that we invest in our people and hiring the right person. Because if you hire well, you can delegate. And ultimately, as a leader of your, of your business, you want to you wanna focus on your vision. And you, you don't need to get distracted by being pulled into the operations bit. So if you hire well, you can delegate. Um, so that, that was my thing. I need to hire an excellent marketing guy. I've got one. Um, I'm going through digital transformation. I know nothing about technology and I didn't plan on learning. I'm hiring the best developer I can find in Ivory Coast. I have him. Um, so investing in that. Then the other thing is I set them up in, in offices, um, and I invested in their material, um, because I just think that if you have the right setup, considering the long hours that you're going to work, you need, you need simple things. You need a great laptop. You need a great screen. You need a great mouse. You need a great desk, a chair. It's part of me telling you I value the work that you're going to be doing. I want you to be set up properly. I want you to be in an office that has a good internet connection, and I want you to be happy to come to work. I'm not here, but this is a reflection of who I am. I'm set up, I've got a great setup. I want you to have a great setup that will help you do your work. I think these are key investments. Um, so I'm running through my list. <laughs> we have very regular meetings. So we've got like a team meeting on a Monday where we run through what we've done during the weekend, what's cooking. We use Teams. I think it's phenomenal. I think we're so lucky to have all these tech tools now that make our life so easy. We, you know, you can set up projects, share notes, everything is there. So it's so easy. And we do something, I value um, mental health. And at the end of each um, weekly call, Monday morning weekly call, we have a word of the week, which is a reflection of what we want to put out there. So if we know that we are going to have a hard week, we might pick a word that reflects on that. If we know that we need a little energy, it might be energy. And we put it there, reflect on this. 
And it's a way for us to sort of, you know, cling on to it and, and just feel that we're all in this together. Um, another thing we do when you're all together in the same office, it's easy to know you, your co-workers, you know them, you know what they, how they like to drink their tea or their coffee, you know, what happens in their family. When you're all remote, you have no clue. So on Friday, we do do some form of a game. So it started like very structured where it, was, it would be like, okay, we are Pan-African. We need to know everything about Africa. So it'd be like a quiz. And then it moves into, you know what, let's split in teams and you guys are going to talk about what your favorite food is. So I now know that Nat is based in Johannesburg. She loves a good crab curry and she loves to dance to Justin Timberlake. Um, just to make that extra effort and be intentional about knowing each other. Um, Pre-COVID, we used to meet and have like team building, doing hiking, you know, spending a week together, having someone uh, moderating some sessions. That's something that I find, you know, very important. Um, I've started like a Strava group because I'm a runner. Uh, turns out I'm the only athlete on my AMA team, but that's okay. The intention was there. It's like to run as a team. Um, and then, yeah, we try to have lunch, breakfast together, just to just to to build to build that relationship. And it turns out that everybody is great friends. And I find out that you know our IT guy in Abidjan have some sometimes has chats with the daughter, the son of uh, of um, Amy, who's based in Durban, and they have chats uh, after his school day, where he's like, "Can I call Josué?" And they have like a little 10 minute chat. I think it's amazing. We're building a family. I like that. I like that emphasis on team bonding. I think, I think it's really, really critical. Thank you so much, Aline. So I'm going to go to, should I say the hottest topic, pricing and you know, pitching yourself. And we're just discussing before the session started. Personally, pricing was something that I really, really struggled with when I was running my agency. And sometimes it's just that thing of how do I benchmark? How do I how, how, what do I even say? And sometimes because of our currency to say this thing is going to cost 1 million, I'm like, ah, oh, isn't this too much? But I think that is something that we need to start getting comfortable with. So I'm going to come to Samuel and I want to start with pitching for new clients and also pricing. We know that that's essential. What are the factors to bear in mind? And I want to, I want to put pitching and pricing together just because as you are pitching, you also need to think about how much am I going to get out of it? What is value to me? What is worth charging? So what are some of the factors to bear in mind when pricing and pitching our services? And then what strategies have worked for you? Um, thanks so much. So pricing and pitching are probably, especially at the beginning of um, your company, pricing and pitching are probably the maker and breaker of your dreams, right? It's very important to get that straight at the beginning. So I want to tell you my own personal testimony and I've had about a hundred percent track record of winning all the pitch I did at the beginning when I founded my company and my, some of my leadership team are here as well. They know that if Sami goes, then we're going to be able to win this project, right? So at the very beginning of when I founded my company, I created a strategy that includes there's no rule to it, but number one, be very comprehensive. When you start at the beginning, the best thing about it is you don't have a lot of projects at hand. You're not very busy. So our pitch is extremely comprehensive. We go all in. What that means is we do creative. We do not just the draft press release, but we actually compose the press release, translate it into local language and show them exactly which media that we're gonna display it in. We include contact information some of the event strategy, some of the mock-up of the event, we actually go to a venue, take a picture, create, create a creative mock-up. And by the time we went to the third slide, I'm not talking, I'm just going through slides, going through slides. And the client is, this is incredible, right? But other agencies come in with an idea. They just have a couple of PowerPoint that says, here's what we're gonna do. Because they're not as hungry as you are at the beginning of your business, you're extremely hungry. So my strategy that I tell everybody is they can take your idea. A lot of people have done it. They can take your idea and do it themselves or give it to another agency. That should be the risk you should be willing to take at the beginning of starting your own agency. So go all in out, be absolutely comprehensive. When it comes to pricing, I say the psychology of financial proposals 
is extremely important. At Spotlight, at the beginning, there was a little problem because we spend 90% of our time working on our technical proposal. And the account team, the account execs work on the financial proposal only 10% of the time, five to 10% of the time. We have like one day before we submit and they're just looking at the technical proposal or the pitch, okay, location, what are we doing? How many press releases? How many translations? This and this and that. And then they just jam it together before you know it, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then when we send it, you have to understand the psychology of clients. They're always about return on investment. The first thing they see is the total amount. They're not looking at the 15% tax. They're not looking at agency fee. They're looking at the final one. So what I did, for example, to give you a specific example, one of the local businesses I won at the beginning that really laid the foundation uh, for Spotlight Communications and Marketing is called Origin Mineral Water. It's a local business with a global affiliation or equity investment. So what, what I did was instead of, you know, the other agencies came up with a retainer fee, that's just lump sum. There you go. This is how much you're going to pay me every month. What I did was the campaign is burst, sustain, and maintain. So I started with, I remember like 200,000, 250,000 at the first three months. And then uh, I'm talking local currency, it's not $250,000. And then 90,000 for the next six months, every month, and then 45,000 as we phase it out, right? But other agencies went in there and said, 100,000 every month, right? But mine was extremely strategic because I took the time to sit down with my account execs and say, okay, this is about return on investment. We have an amazing technical proposal. The pitch is incredible. But what we want to do is we want to phase it out just like this. At the beginning of the campaign, they're going to jump in a lot of activities. That's what we want to charge them. And that literally created uh, a very creative a financial proposal. So what I ask everybody is understand the psychology of money and the psychology of your clients. They're just going to look at the total sum if it's a uh, project based, if it's retainer, the same thing. So you're going to have to talk return on their investment, right? PR is health. We're protecting reputation. We're solving crises. They want to be able to pay. They, they're willing to pay whatever it takes, but your return on investment has to match your financials and your technical proposal together. So pricing, and pitching are extremely important. I spend majority of my time teaching my leadership team and heads of functions on their ability to be able to pitch, understanding the document and how will you be able to implement it, right? That's very, very critical. Wow, I feel like I need to come for a masterclass with you, Samuel. Thank you so much for that. Tutu, I'm also going to come to you. And I also want you to touch on, because you have the freelance experience. So somebody says, I want you to manage my Instagram page. I want you to handle comms for an event. What are the factors you bear in mind when you're thinking of price? And did you have any, were you uncomfortable with pricing at some point? Uh, hi, Tutu. Okay. Yes, when I first started, I was a bit uncomfortable with pricing just because of input. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you can now. Can you hear me now? Hello? Hi, Tutu, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Because, you know, the regular things that happen down, you're feeling like you're an imposter, why should I charge this more? Hello? <clears throat> Hello? We can hear you, Tutu. Okay, I think the, the timeline was messing up. Sorry about that. So I'll just start again quickly. When I first started, yes, I was scared at first because of the regular things that happened. Doubts, feeling like you're an imposter. Why should I charge this much? How much should I charge? But I think I'll just share some points that helped me along the way. The first thing was understanding the country I was in. When I first wanted to start my agency, I spoke to my friends in America, my friends in England who had kind of started boutique agencies and they would tell me, oh, you know, we charge $5,000. And I was, <laughs> I was like, no, this is Nigeria. Um, I had to think of the country I was in and then equate that with the service and what I was bringing. 
um, people have different strong points. And I knew that with my agency, creativity and content was something that made us always stand out. Our clients were always happy with the content that we delivered, the way we handled their page and the professionalism that we brought to the table. So when it comes to pitching to clients, I noticed that even with social media managers, so it doesn't matter the field you're in, we either comes, you know, graphic design, you want to build an agency. I noticed that there was a level of surprise when I had branding documents. I would have, I had a company profile. This is for a digital marketing. Even when I was a social media agency, you know, they speak to social media managers and then they, you know, it was a bit of all over the place. I had my company profile. And then for each client, I would kind of create what I called kind of like an imagination of how your page would look like if you worked with us. So I would do a mock feed. I would show captions. I would show how your page is going to look, how your page, your followers are going to grow over time. And then I would tell you, you know, this is what your page would look like if you moved to TAC. And apart from keeping, getting my clients, I also had to think of strategies to keep them. So these were things like regular check-ins, weekly calls, having an administrative officer who always checked up on them and gave them regular updates. And then we did this thing called refer and earn because when it comes to pitching to clients, there's nothing as great as peer-to-peer -peer review. Your client saying, oh my God, I love my page. These guys are amazing. And somebody else is just checking my name out and quickly copying it to call me later on. I feel like that's one of the best things. So we started this thing called refer and earn. So if you are a client and somebody else called us and said, oh, your client called me, we would send them an email offering them, you know, free graphics. We would say, okay, you get this and so discount on your next month's payment. And they were always happy with that. So that's just on the side. So when it came to pricing, I realized that there were, I had to think of the Nigerian economy. So rather than having a one-off fee, I kind of created a cherry picking package. So with my own rates, I have kind of like package one, package two, package three, what I can offer you. And then I have a drop down list of different services that encompass what I do. So if you can't afford package one, package two, package three, maybe there's even just something that we can do for you. So that way it's a win-win situation for me and I don't lose the clients regardless. They are picking something from my list or picking a package or consulting. So it's always a win-win for me. So I think that those are my strategies. Amazing. Thank you so much. We're getting to the end, but I, I would really like Liz and Elimi to just add just one or two things to what your approach to pricing and pitching. Just very briefly, who wants to go first? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Liz. So similar approach to Samuel. I think he, uh, having a varied pricing model is key because you always look for retainers. Of course, it's very reassuring to have to know how much money you're going to get at the end of the month and at the end of the year from a, from a set number of, of clients. And I did mention that that was also how I would hire against. But what makes the revenue grow is the smaller bits and pieces. Uh, and that's also what Tutu has just mentioned. So we have a very varied and very flexible rate card. And we can basically tap into everything. You want just a press release distribution in one country, we can do that for that amount. You want one country, one country plus translation, you do this. You only want a comm strategy for ECOWAS, we can do that. Um, you want a package of press releases, fine, we'll do this. So I think having a sort of an a la carte menu gives reassures comms people in our in an industry that's that moves so quickly, we need to be able to adapt, pivot, and, and, and basically provide a flexible way of working. And, and I think it's the only way to actually grow. That's my- I love that. What about you, Liz? Sure, um, yeah, agree. I mean, I'm just so grateful to be on this panel learning from my colleagues. This is amazing. Um, one of the rules, one of the things we realized with pricing, since we work in the US, we work in Nigeria, we work across many markets, is that we have to be very aware of the customer's spending power before we pitch a price. So, you know, I think we struggled with that for a little while because, you know, in these growth and transition phases where you're, you know, in the beginning, you know, you can take on things because they're going to build your portfolio. You can take on things. Maybe they're a little bit less than what you would want, but you do it. And then you have that transition period where it's like, well, I don't want to be putting in all this work. I don't need the platform as much. I don't need the reputation as much. 
And then you quickly, we, we kind of raised our prices, but we realized that we were raising them for the wrong clients. Um, you know, um, so for us, it was about customer segmentation, like understanding the different markets, the different types of clients that we work with, and then pitching prices accordingly. We had, um, like one of, one of our partners mentioned that she got a proposal, not on comms, but on something else that was like double her organization's budget. And she couldn't even have a conversation. Like she, there's just no way you can negotiate from that. So yeah, really understanding that. Um, I would say the other thing, um, one of my mentors gave me really good advice that is in my head now. Um, I don't know who knows the rules of baseball in this crowd. It's a very American sport. I understand it's very confusing for non-Americans, but basically um, you can have a single, a double, a triple, or a home run. You always want to swing for the home run. You want to have that big, big win. But what's really important is getting on base. It's getting on first. It's that single that can then get you across the baseball diamond. So what, we can have another baseball lesson at another time, but, but it's really, you want to be swinging for the home runs but you also have to remember that those little small projects, like you said, Eloine, are the ones that actually keep your business going. So segmenting and realizing what the differences between those are. And I will also say, um, your relationships matter. I, we haven't really spoken about that, but like we have applied to things that are RFPs, cold RFPs, and officially uh, my chief business officer and co-founder has says no more because people know who they want to work with. <laughs> like if you've had a positive working experience with somebody, you know, it's, that gets passed and to, to and from. Um, so I would say really, really focusing on the relationships that you have. And then those relationships can also sometimes help you say how much to price. Um, even if finance isn't like fully transparent on their website, somebody who works inside will know that if you want to pitch a hundred thousand dollar comms contract, but their budget is 50 K they're going to tell you, please slow down the, the budget, you know? So yeah, that's what I would say. Wow. Thank you so much. I mean, I already knew that this session would want extra time, but we have less than 15 minutes, but I would do the final round of questions. And if we can't take any questions, we will, if we can't participants, we need to connect the speakers offline. So the last question is, and this is for everybody. Can you share one best practice to adopt and one trap or mistake that you would advise people to, ad to avoid when they want to start their businesses? So one best practice to adopt and one trap and mistake from your experience that they should avoid. So who wants to go first? Uh, should I just say what, Samuel, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, so in terms of best practice, for example, if you look at my leadership team or my heads of functions, most of them are interned four years ago, right? It's uh, one of the things I would really love to tell anyone who wants to start their own PR firm or consultancy or agency is at the very beginning of starting your company, focus on people. That's, I know this is, I mean, everybody says this, uh, but it's very important to develop your people from the very beginning. If you have a very long-term vision, it's extremely critical that you focus on people and you create them. And in terms of trap, it's the same thing. It's also people, right? For example, I've set up my leadership team or maybe Liz or uh, Eloin, you guys have set up your team in different parts of the world and everybody's really doing great. Sometimes what happens is huge reliability on one asset is gonna destroy a lot of things. No matter how much you pay, no matter your engagement strategies. So both the trap and the best practice in my case has been, if there has ever been a time where my company has been shook to the core, it's because of people, right? And if there's ever been a time where my company succeeded incredibly well, it's again because of people. So you need to be able to find that balance, that same balance between engaging your employees and at the same time trying to make sure your business is sustainable without relying on one asset or a group of people as well. Amazing. I really love that. Thank you, Samuel. Eloine, so what about you? A hundred percent agree. It's people, 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 people. And I think um, in terms of best practice, it also starts with us, I think, being ready to be really disciplined. So Liz and I, work on a complete different time zone with teams that can be eight hours ahead of us. 
but we wake up really early, you know, and this is it. And we show that to the team, the see us show up for a pitch at 4 a.m. and we're there ready. Um, so I think showing the discipline, uh, you know, you, you really, it comes from, it, it goes from top to bottom. It's like, if you show that you, that you work hard and you, you set the, the right example, then things work. And I think also investing in ourselves quite a lot. So yeah, same as what Sammy was saying, um, you need the right people, but you also need to upskill them. And there are so many amazing tools now. I mean, we use Coursera. We're feeling that we need a little upskill on a particular element or like on, you know, branding. At some point we've, we felt, oh, branding is not really our forte. Let's look into a course. And we all sat there and dedicated every Friday for the next whatever number of weeks um, to, to get a certification. Um, keeping on learning ourselves. I think having a mentor, as Liz mentioned, is amazing. I think I was a bit too slow to get one, but I think it's very, very important or getting like a business coach. Um, and I think the bottom line also is, I think at the beginning, and it comes back to your first question, but I think that's something that I really want to share is you need, if you go into that crazy, difficult industry and business, and you decide that this is what you want to do and build the business within communications, you need to be really clear about your why. Why are you doing that? Because if your why is not defined, it really isn't worth it. It's not worth it. You might be better off working for an agency. You might be better off just freelancing. If it is a business that you want to start, be very clear about why you're going into this because it's tons of sweat, blood, and tears. But it's so rewarding. <laughs> I can testify to that last part. It's, I mean, I think it was Liz that was saying that, you know, you think, oh, you're going into the business. I set my own hours. It is actually, sometimes you're like, why am I doing this? But that why, because you've thought about it, actually does sustain you. So I very much agree. Liz, do you want to add to your perspective as well? Yeah, I think, I mean, so much on the people. Like, yes, I just want to, I need to give a shout out to even my team yesterday who led Baobab Consulting's panel. Um, Lara, who's on this call now, uh, moderated an event. Um, and I'm just like, I totally, for me, I take pride in my team. And I think my team being successful is my success. And I am, I, so I just totally, I had to just brag a little bit about, about her performance yesterday and our panel yesterday and all of that. So, but back to some, some traps, um, time wasters. I, 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 you know, there are people out there who really just want to get you on a call. They want to talk to you. They want to ask you for advice and that's fine. And for me, I'm a people person. I like being around people. I like talking about people. Uh, I like, you know, solving problems and especially when they're mission aligned to what I believe in. But at the end of the day, like as when you're running an agency, your time is literally billed <laughs> for the hour. So you really have to be careful about just like kind of if, you know, if, it, what is what is that saying? Um, if you give away the milk, nobody's gonna buy the cow, right? So you can't just give away all of your, you know, your expertise. Um, and that same goes. There was a question earlier about um, proposal writing. I think um, Samuel, you and I may have a little bit of a different approach. That I feel like sometimes these proposals. You're right. Like, and and you've encouraged me to be more risky in certain things. But when you go back and forth. Uh, with people on the proposal. Well, I want to remove this. Well, I want to add this. Well, I want by the end of the day, you have literally put together their comms plan and that is not compensated. So I think being aware of those types of people in your network, those types of people who want to come and just kind of like get your stuff for free, just be aware. Sometimes you have to do it um, and you, and it's worth it. The risk is greater and or the, the reward is greater than the risk, but being aware because it is a trap. Um, and then in terms of, you know, the best practice, um, 
yeah, I'll just stick with, stick with that team, right? Like if you genuinely care about the people that you work for, they're going to show up and help you when you need it. And it should not be transactional. I mean, that's, that's what, I, this is the way I believe, um, you know, I don't think everything is about, you know, a dollar and cents value at the end of the day. It's, you know, um, are you growing? Are you learning? Are you accessing different you know, opportunities through the agency? Like, are you happy to be here? That's my, I spend a lot of time on that uh, because I genuinely want the people around me to be happy, to be growing and to be helping me build the business, you know? Um, and all of that is aligned. So that's where I'll, I'll pause. Thank you, Liz. And Tutu? Okay, so for my best practice, I would say have build a system from the point where you get the clients to the point where you maybe unfortunately lose the client. So the, the welcome email, your pitch, your brand profile, your corporate profile, you know, have a template for even the proposal you're going to have for your clients, onboarding, checklists, questionnaires, anything that you need. Imagine yourself as the agency already and think of every single thing you're going to need from the beginning to the end. So that's my advice on best practices. For traps, I would say bad clients, um, you will at some point in time meet a bad client. Bad clients can be anything from rude to manipulative to, you know, not paying on time. You just have to keep that in mind. But my advice for you is that you, you can moan, you can complain, but never be rude about your client to your team. Maintain a level of professional energy when you are projecting it to your team because how you speak about your client behind their back is how your team is going to speak to them. So yes, you're going to meet black, bad clients along the way, but do have a process or do have a you know an emotionally intelligent way of handling it, but never project that bad energy to your teammates. So yeah. Wow, I really love that about, about the energy. And you're right, you meet all sorts of people in, in, in this journey. And that is really, really critical. I mean, we have about four minutes. I'm so grateful to all of the panel. I feel like we should, there's still so many questions. I know people have questions, but as takeaways for everyone, I think that one of the things that has come out for me is definitely people. And if you're even starting out as a freelancer, have an understanding of why, what are you doing? And what helped me also when I was starting out is just having phone calls with people. How much do you charge? I want to do this. So you want to write a comms plan. How much are other people charging? And have the confidence, like Tutu had said, to actually charge. Because sometimes imposter syndrome doesn't allow us to charge what we are worth. So what, one thing when I started freelancing as a writer, for example, and someone said she charged 20 naira per word. And I, I think I used to, I, I can't even say what I used to charge. So I started with five naira, moved up to seven, moved up, you know, as my confidence grew. So please work on your confidence. It's very, very, very important. And definitely just learn as you go, pace yourself. Finances, I know we don't talk about finances a lot, but if there's one thing I also want you to take out of this session is, Keep your eyes on the money. If you need to go and take a course on, and thank God there's Coursera, there's so many courses to learn. Keep your eyes on the finances. If you need to hire a team, hire the right team. How are you going to pay them? And it's going to be very, very critical. So thank you everyone for joining. This session was hosted by the Comms Avenue. We're a capacity building platform for communications professionals. And we have over 500 communications professionals from Nigeria, Ghana, Tanzania, Senegal, I mean, just all across Africa and beyond. So if you would like to join us, I would put the information. You can also follow our website as well. We share resources and materials for communications professionals. And thank you for your questions. I know we're not able to take them, but if you could reach out to the speakers or reach out to me directly, I can ensure that they answer. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. So amazing. Thank you. Big shout out to Annie and uh, Aniola. Thank you, ladies. Yes, thank you. Thank you.